Welcome to the Legally Speaking Podcast. You are now listening to season seven of the show. I'm your host, Rob Hanna. I've got some exciting news for you. Legally Speaking Podcast is hitting the road and heading to ClioCon 2023 in Nashville from October the 9th to the 10th. Imagine two days jam-packed with game-changing insights, networking opportunities, and the chance to connect with legal minds from around the globe. Whether you're an attorney, paralegal, or just someone passionate about about the world of law, this conference is for you. So mark your calendars and join us at ClioCon 2023 and see you in Nashville. This week, I'm delighted to be joined by Thomas Grant KC. Thomas is a barrister at Wilberforce Chambers and was appointed as King's Counsel in 2013. Thomas was called to the Bar of England and Wales in 1993, to the Bar of the British Virgin Islands in 2015, and the Bar of Cayman Islands in 2022. Thomas specialises in civil fraud, asset recovery, commercial disputes, company law, professional liability, and property. He practises in the Chancery Division and Commercial Court. Thomas also has expertise in international arbitration media and entertainment law. He was the visiting professor of politics and law at Gresham College and now is a visiting professor of law at the London School of Economics. Tom is the author and editor of numerous textbooks. In the summer of 2022, his book titled The Mandela Brief was published. Thomas was awarded Chancery Silk of the Year in 2021 by Chambers and Partners. This year, he's been described as a powerhouse in both his thinking and as an advocate. He is preposterously intelligent by the Legal 500. So a very warm welcome, Thomas. Hey, Rob. Nice to be here. Thank you. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. And before we dive into all your amazing projects, experiences, and what you've been getting up to for the wider for legal community, we do have a customary icebreaker question here on the show, which is, on the scale of 1 to 10... 10 being very real, what would you rate the hit TV series Suits in terms of its reality of the law if you've seen it? Okay, assuming that the 1 to 10 scale of of unreal to very real is to be uh, benchmarked against my own experience and the life of an English barrister, then between 1 and 2, I very unreal, which is not in any way a criticism of Suits as a as a splendid um TV show. The the 3 attributes of suits that I think are, are, are most pertinent here are one, they always win their cases. Two, they never seem to spend any time actually sitting at a desk studying, doing the hard graft of studying papers. And three, law appears to be uh, practiced through a series of breakthrough moments, sitting in a library, th- suddenly realizing that they've discovered the precedent that's going to unlock the key to success. Sadly, much as I'd love to say that is my life day in, day out. It's not for the following three reasons. One, shockingly, I do not always win my cases. I win, a, I win quite a few of them, but I, my God, I lose some of them as well and lose them badly. Secondly, there is no such thing as a breakthrough moment in my practice. There's an awful lot of hard graft reading endless authorities and trying to build a case back on the back of them. And thirdly, sadly for me, 90% of my time is not spent having forensically marvellous moments in a courtroom. It is sitting at a desk with vast numbers of files, whether virtual or actually surrounding me, and reading and reading and more and more and more papers. The difference between my, my life and the Suits life is that my life would not be a televisual one, whereas the Suits one, of course, is very, very televisual and very successful and, and enjoyable as a result. So one to 10, but that's, a, that's very much one, one or two on the scale of one to 10 but that's very much a compliment to Suits. Well, and I think that's probably one of the most precise and articulated and rational answers we had on the show. So I'm giving you a 10 for your response for that, Tom. And with that, we should move swiftly on to continue to talk more about you. So would you mind telling our listeners more about your background and career journey? My background is a very, very ordinary background, Um, keeping it as short as possible. I was born in England's greatest county, Essex, uh, and England's greatest uh, town now city, Colchester, uh, and was brought up in Essex for a, for a period of time. Um, went to a school in Colchester, went to, a, went to Bristol University to study English literature, and by the end of my three years at, at uh, university was suddenly thinking, crikey, I, I, I'm going to have to get some kind of job at the end of this um, 
experience and somebody said well somebody was going to study law as a postgraduate course of a friend of mine and I thought crikey perhaps I should do that as well so I knowing nothing about anything uh, and certainly know nothing about law I went to City University to do a conversion course in law and did that and then did a bar my my so-called bar finals another year learning how to be a barrister or pretending to learn how to be a barrister and then then had to do the, the business of applying for a pupillage I the one year kind of apprenticeship that one does in order to become a barrister and I made many, many applications to many, many chambers, still being an absolute know-nothing about, about the law. Um, was fortunate to find a chambers that was foolishly willing to give me a pupillage. Uh, a smallish chambers, but with some top people in it, although as a chambers, it was not a successful enterprise in the end, as I'll, as I'll come on to, and was extremely lucky to do a pupillage with a chap who is, um, has become very well known indeed, and who's been very influential in my life over a long period of time, called Hugh Tomlinson. And Hugh Tomlinson, who, Rob, I'm sure you've heard of, and some of your listeners will have heard of, has become the kind of doyen of the uh, defamation and privacy bar, doing an awful lot of very, very high profile celebrity cases. Most recently, he appeared in the trial of Vardy v. Rooney last year. Uh, he was for the losing side. He was for Mrs. Vardy. And he now finds himself impersonated on stage nightly in the very successful play of Vardy v. Rooney. In those days, Hugh was not quite as famous as he is now, but was as brilliant as he is now and as hardworking as he is now. And he was, I'd sat with him as a pupil for six months. I learned an awful lot about him, about him and about the law. And he galvanized me into really learning to love the law. Um, we've written a couple of books together. We've done a lot of cases together. He's still a friend of mine. and. Um, he was a you know, vital stepping stone towards my career at the bar. We were in chambers together for a while. I remained in New Court Chambers, as it was then known as. It's now disappeared as a chambers. And then I've gradually moved to different chambers and over the years. And here I am, frankly, 30 years later, almost 30 years later, sitting in Lincoln's Inn in Wilberforce Chambers. The, the work I do now is very different to the work I did then. Um, but that's part of my you know, the haphazard evolution of a career at the bar. No, and thank you for that. And you, you talk about some important things that we like to talk around on the show as sort of inspirational people or mentors that are, are, are with you or help you start your career or, you know, help you get it. You know, maybe you've gone in certain directions and looking for direction. And it's really great that you point to, to Hugh, who obviously is exceptionally well known. And for folks, definitely make sure you go and do some wider research and look into his his background as well. And we, we're going to talk about the present day um, and a little bit more, but I want to talk about some of the areas you, you specialize in, because I find your areas fascinating, you know, civil fraud, asset recovery, commercial disputes, company law, professional liability, you know, property. Just tell us a bit about, you know, some of the areas that you most enjoy and, you know, what, what that looks like. So I think the point I wanted to just step back one, a couple of steps, which is that some people go to the bar knowing exactly what they want to do. They have a, a very clear vision. They want to do work in human rights law, let's say, or they want to do work in criminal law, uh, or they want to do work in international law. And they've often nowadays got multiple degrees in this subject and MAs and MPhils and what have you. And they have an absolutely clear uh, laser-like focus in terms of where they want to be. That is the 100% opposite to me, who, as I say, went to the bar really knowing very little about it. And actually, as far as I was concerned when I started, criminal law was all that barristers ever did. I had no conception that there might be something called civil law, i.e. cases where individuals and companies sue each other rather than the state sues you for or prosecutes you for, a, for, an, alleged, for an alleged crime, um, with the result that I, I very quickly realized I wasn't going to be a criminal barrister, uh, not least because the, the chambers I went to didn't really do any criminal law. As to what I did, I started off doing all sorts of cases, personal injury cases, a lot of mortgage cases, which are, are well, I wouldn't describe as the most interesting area of the law ever imagined, but still, and landlord and ten, tenant cases, and some family cases as well about children, about what happens to children when, when husbands and wives or partners fall out. Uh, I was doing all sorts of cases, and it was only gradually and over a long period of time that my interests um, and specialisms coalesced. And you've mentioned a few of them in your question. Uh, these are areas I've arrived at over many years of trial and error and um, working out what, 
what I'm interested in and what I'm good at, uh, frankly. And um, civil fraud, you mentioned. Now, civil fraud has become quite a, I suppose, a sexy area uh, over the last few years. And um, I got into it over time. Uh, essentially, it is a area of law uh, where companies or, or sometimes individuals assert that they have been defrauded in all sorts of different ways into making transactions which uh, they wouldn't have otherwise made and which have been massively loss-making transactions. Or companies bring claims against directors of their companies or shareholders of those companies on the basis that they, the assets of the companies have been stripped out through the dishonesty of those in charge of the companies. Uh, fraud takes, as everyone will know, many, many different um, uh, articulations and, inc and incarnations. Commercial disputes, company law, professional liability, I'll do that rather more quickly. Commercial disputes are cases typically brought by companies against other companies, typically because they have entered into contractual arrangements with them for, for all sorts of uh, contractual ventures and things go wrong and one company wants to sue the other, and typically that involves looking at the contractual arrangements they've entered into and working out what rights and liabilities those contracts uh, create, and that generates an awful lot of litigation in England as well, and typically very much international litigation. England uh, is a one of its great exports, one of its great qualities as well, is that its law is very much appreciated by litigants around the world, so that when a company enters into a contract with another company. That company may be Venezuelan, it might be Malaysian, and, and its counterparty might be another Malaysian company or a Russian company or a French company or a German company. And the question is, when they enter into their contracts, where do they want their disputes to be litigated? And typically, they want their disputes to be litigated in an English courtroom. And you can choose where you want your, your disputes litigated as, a, as companies uh, and as contracting parties. And for, for reasons which are very beneficial to English lawyers, they typically, international companies, if they're going to have to be sued, sue each other, they want their claims to be brought in England because they think that English courts are un incorruptible, which, and they're right. They think English lawyers are rather good. And they're pretty right in that regard as well. And they think the justice they'll get is very qu high quality justice. And they're right in that regard. And that, of course, provides enormous benefits to English lawyers because they end up doing the cases even they've got nothing to do with England rather than French lawyers or German lawyers or Venezuelan or Venezuelan lawyers. So that's another area I spend a lot of time a lot of time doing and doing cases for typically international international concerns. Company law, I'll pass over that for a while. Professional liability is the last the last or the, the penultimate area you you um, asked me about. Professional liability is another area I do an awful lot of work awful lot of work in, uh, in fact, written a couple of books in that area. That is about, um, it's a subject matter where uh, professional people, whether they're lawyers, whether they're accountants, uh, whether they're surveyors, uh, whether they're actuaries, obviously the, the, the world is very professionalized and companies and individuals seek professional advice an awful lot in their personal lives and their, and their business lives. And sometimes, I'm afraid to say, professionals get it wrong and they give wrong advice or they make uh, errors in the advice they give or the service they provide. And uh, there is a very highly developed law in England called professional negligence or professional liability, where individuals sue their professionals for having got it wrong. And um, I've, I've done an awful lot of that in my life. And I'm, I've written, written, as I say, a couple of books in that area. And indeed, I'm one of my areas at the moment and one of my responsibilities at the moment is being the so-called chair of the professional negligence bar association which doesn't sound fantastically sexy i i, I agree <laughs> but it is some uh, where we as barristers um gather together and share our learnings and share our experiences and try to uh, enhance the quality of professional negligence litigation which has generated an awful lot of, of cases and there's a very developed uh, to use a rather grandiloquent phrase, a developed jurisprudence about it. So that's another subject uh, that I spend a lot of time doing cases about. Um, so that's a very long answer, Rob, to what was actually a very simple and direct question. So I hope that's a, a little, little um, brief survey of the kind of areas that I do. And I should say a lot of other barristers 
do as well. It's not the kind of area, that's not the kind of area which you would think about as lawyers doing if you were wandering down the street. Because you think about barristers doing cases involving theft or, or murder or things like that. But in fact, um, individuals sue each other and companies sue each other all the time. And there are very large numbers of barristers and indeed solicitors who spend their life uh, uh, working on those cases and providing advice in those cases. So to your listeners who are thinking of going into the law, uh, there is a much wider area of law than the kind of areas that I was, I was thinking about when I was 18 or 19 or, or even indeed into my early 20s, which is criminal law, family law, personal injury law, and so-called human rights law. There's a very large, a much wider area of law than that. And that's where I'm at. No, and I think you've given a really good example of, um, you know, not only some, some, some case studies, it was just fascinating listening to the civil fraud side of things and how that became an area of extreme interest. And then, you know, how, how your sort of workings have led on to, to writing numerous books. I'm going to talk a bit more about those a little bit later on as well. Um, no, really appreciate you um, giving us a deep dive into that. Let's talk a little bit about where you practice, you know, in the Chancery Division and Commercial Court. Again, for our listeners who may not be so familiar with them, can you explain what they are and how they work? So the... The, the the courts of in, of England and Wales, which is like the the legal jurisdiction, which is conjoined England and Wales. Scotland has got its own jurisdiction. I won't deal. I won't deal with that. Um, the courts are divided into various types of court. Uh, there is there are the county courts, which is a a kind of deals with slightly lower value cases, and there are county courts across 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 England. And I spent many years of my life. Um, doing cases in county courts and cutting my teeth. And indeed, occasionally I still do cases in the county court. And some of the cases that happen in the county court are very, very high value, very important. But where I'm generally spending my, my time is in the so-called Chancery Division and the Commercial Court. And they are offshoots of the High Court. And the High Court, which is the a conjoined court of England, divides itself into the so-called Family Court, Family Division rather. And that's sometimes I go into the Family Division and do cases there but not, not that frequently. There is the what used to be the Queen's Bench Division, which has now become, after the accession of the King, King's Bench Division, and that's, the Commercial Court is within the King's Bench Division, but the King's Bench Division does all sorts of cases, some of them involving personal injury cases, some of them involving what is known as judicial review cases, and all sorts of cases like that. But then on the other side, there is the so-called Chancery Division, uh, which is divided into a lot of subdivisions, but the Chancery Division, which is where I mainly practice is a, is a uh, an area uh, or a set of judges sitting in a set of courts dealing with what is one, one might loosely describe as business cases cases involve company disputes which i you asked a question about I didn't properly answer but company disputes i companies which is the, obviously the typical vehicle by which business is done in england that that there's a huge area known as company law shareholders falling out companies suing directors etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, property law, that's the real property where uh, people sue each other as regards who owns who owns a particular property, what rights people have over real property. They, that's where the Chancery Division ha has another speciality. And fraud cases are typically uh, tried in the Chancery Division and indeed in the Commercial Court as well. And the, they're, they're all under one general aegis called the Business and Property Courts. And they have this very, very fancy new courtroom or courthouse, I should say, in what is known as the Rolls Building, which is a very modern building, only opened a few years ago, on Fetter Lane, which is in the heart of legal London, very close to Chancery Lane, very close to the old Royal Courts of Justice. Um, and this, is a, this was a court centre, which has got 30 courts and, and many other courtrooms where other more lower judges sit, and they deal with business cases generally. And so most of my life is spent walking from my chambers over to the uh, Rolls building, to this very hypermodern uh, uh, courthouse, um, and going into the courts there and doing, ca doing, cases, doing cases there. So that's, in very broad terms, um, what the Chancery Division is and the Commercial Court. And the, the key thing for your younger listeners is that those do not involve juries. Those are courts in which a judge a single judge sits on a bench raised above you. You appear. You are sitting on the. So you are sitting at the bar, so to speak, where the barristers uh, 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 make their submissions from, and you are making submissions to a single judge in a very modern uh, and very spacious courtroom. 
Well, again, thank you. That's really, really helpful, particularly for people who say who are thinking about entering the profession and, and the differences. And some of our listeners would also would have attended a an, an event that we hosted a while ago with the London Young Lawyers Group at the Supreme Court. And that was a fascinating yes. experience. And you mentioned Fetter Lane. I used to work just off Fetter Lane. That's bringing back memories of when I used to walk around and used to see all the barristers and, you know, carting all the all the equipment and so forth um, around. Yeah, well, yeah the, clerk, the clerks, the clerk, I mean, nowadays, the, clerk, the clerks in the old days who were there are clerks in every chambers. One of their one of their jobs would be in the morning with their huge trolleys carrying the vast numbers of files over to court um, because cases are very paper, cases in the Chancery Division, the Commercial Court are typically very paper heavy. There'll be dozens and dozens sometimes of files of papers which one which are all paginated. One needs to know exactly where they are. One needs to refer to them when presenting one's case. Now. If I can just slightly uh, butt in on a on a, a recent development in the law, which is that nowadays paper is much less evident in courtrooms because uh, the judges have become much more me, uh, much more um, tech savvy, and now often all the papers are digital only. So you'll go into court without any physical papers at all, but with a bank of of screens which the judge has and the lawyers have, and you will. When you're making your presentation, you'll say, and can you go to file X page 421? And instead of having to pick up a physical file and turn to page 421, an operator will magically click up that page on the screen and everyone in the court will look at the same screen. And that will be the relevant page you're looking at. Um, so there's been a big, uh, a big revolution uh, in the last five years from going from paper to, to digital. And for some of us old timers like me, I suppose I'm not quite an old timer, medium timers, it has involved quite a big culture change and culture shift. Um, but that is that, so the clerk's jobs has become less arduous in that regard. It's not backbreaking kind of shoveling of trolleys um, back and forth to, to court. But that's just one development in the law, which I think I probably took off. Sorry, slight digression from your, from your question, Rob. So back to you. No, but it's it's a good point, and we talk a lot. I mean, we've had a lot of legal tech entrepreneurs that have come onto the um, to the show who've talked about their products and how they're digitalizing and improving and moving things forward. Because you know, a lot of people, if they can get into the mindset of embracing tech, it's typically to you know make life easier, better, faster, more efficient. You know, and I think you gave a great example there. You know, actually, this technology is really helping people. It is. It is much more efficient because I mean, just to take a very banal example. Whereas in the past, you'd say, can you pick up file Z, page, whatever, then the judge would actually physically have to go to his or her bank of files behind them and pick it up and find the and then leaf through it. Whereas now, if you just say the say the reference, there's a, a, a ghost like figure who's not sitting in court, but who's the operator who will magic it up within within a second. That's great in terms of making things go much smoother and much faster. But the 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 difficulty of that is that if your reference is wrong and lawyers occasionally get their page, their page references wrong, then the question is, my God, where the hell is that page? You don't <laughs> actually have the physical, that you can't sort of physically, as I used to in the past, if I had a, I had a bad page reference, quickly go through my file. And think, oh, it's pa- in fact, it's page 400 rather than page 521. Now you're in the sort of desperate straits of trying to work out because it's, you can't physically do it. Crikey, where's that page? And the reality is advocacy works through flow and through relentless uh, step by step building the case, and if you if your reference is wrong, you can often lose that rhetorical flow, and it can undermine the the, the strength and force of your submission. So that is an occupational hazard. Make sure your references are right, and when you're doing a big paper heavy case, then you are giving the judge an awful lot of references, and you you want to damn well make sure those references are right, because otherwise it can become very painful and somewhat embarrassing. Absolutely. Devil is in the detail. Getting the, the small 1% things correct is, is very important, particularly when it comes to, to cases. But let's talk about your career and progression, because in 2013, you were appointed as a King's Counsel. Um, what does that title mean, not only in terms of professionally to the profession, but to you? And what, com- um, what responsibilities come along with that? So there is a there's been a for, for many decades and back centuries, there's been this title. Queen's Council or King's Council, depending on whether there's a king or queen on the throne at, at that moment. And um, it is a, a mark 
of, I suppose you'd say this, a mark of professional recognition and um, quality and experience. And the, the public at large and, the, and litigation, users of litigation services, have a real clear perception of it as a sign that somebody is knows their job well and has had a good experience in it and will give them a hopefully a, a, a quality a quality service. So as a barrister, you spend your first few years as a junior, I just as Thomas Grant, Tom Grant, barrister. And after a while, and you do cases and you, your cases become more typically become more complicated and more high 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 profile is a different matter, but they become more heavy and the amount of money at stake becomes larger and the difficulty becomes larger. And there comes a time when you want to, as a barrister, typically, not everyone does, and some people are very successful without becoming KCs or QCs as they used to be known. Um, so I don't want to be in any way say that this is an absolute necessity for all barristers, but most barristers, if they are interested in having a substantial court practice and a, and a, and a heavy court practice will aspire to becoming a, a, a QC or a KC now. And in the past, it was rather, rather done in a rather informal way, in the sense that you would just make an application on a bit of paper, have a couple of reference referees and the, and the Lord Chancellor, as, as uh, he or she was then known, would make inquiries and take soundings, as they'd say, and grant you the status or not grant you the status. Uh, that that was a, a process which was riven by the potential for the old boys network to be at work. And if you knew the right people and if you were members of the right clubs and you knew the right judges, then you could get you could become a, a QC relatively easily. And, so, and as a result, it was very it was a very exclusive, exclusive in the wrong sense of the term system. And then a few years ago, it was uh, democratized or uh, in some way, I suppose is the right word to put use, whereby from now on, you had your application to become a QC, you in involved you filling out an incredibly detailed form, which I mean, would take two or three weeks to, to do. And I remember filling it out and the pain of it, where you'd have to set out in great detail why you were good enough to become a, a QC, as it then was. And you'd have to uh, tell, tell the, 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 the decision makers uh, about your abilities in this regard and that regard and set out your competencies and set out cases in which you'd shown competence in, in, as an advocate or competence as a team player or competence as a, as a good lawyer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that meant that the, the appointment was much more evidence-based. It became a much more inclusive uh, uh, in the sense of you didn't, it didn't matter whether you knew the right people, so to speak. So it was, a, or by and large, a positive step forward. It made the the process of becoming a QC, jolly hard work. Um, and I remember, as I say, the, the pain of filling out the form and having the interview and the joy of um, being be, of, of succeeding. And it's a great relief to people and, uh, uh, when they succeed. What does it mean in practice? Well, it actually does mean I found quite a lot in practice in the sense of once you get those precious initials after your name, the, the world at large, people who want to use your services, see, well, therefore, there has been a, an independent verification of your quality as an advocate and a lawyer and somebody who is, uh, knows and has experience of, of litigation. Um, and I, I think it was a very important step for me in my own career. Uh, it, I remember the, the relief, as I say, of, of, of succeeding in becoming a QC now, a KC. And what it means is that your career then becomes much more that of a leader of a team. Uh, you do cases typically with juniors, which are junior barristers, where the junior barrister, uh, and sometimes and now I, I do a lot of cases with two juniors, um, uh, who, will, who will do a lot of the legwork, and then you, they will prepare and do a lot of the preparation for a case, and then you, but you come in at a relatively late stage to gather all the, all the um, papers together, to prepare for the particular hearing you've been instructed in and to do the, the advocacy. And typically you're, you're brought in as an advocate who can withstand the rigors of a heavy court hearing, can stand up to the judges, not that the, not that the judges are particularly fierce in, nowadays, but they can, 
you know, they can be very probing in their questioning, quite rightly so. So, so it, it means that your your the work you do slightly changes from being the person who's producing a lot of the background paperwork to being the person who assimilates the paperwork and presents it um, presents it presents it in 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 court. And as a result, I do a lot of court work now. I spend a lot of time uh, uh, in court, but with juniors sitting behind me who have given me an awful lot of assistance in terms of the law and the facts and have kind of you know, been a real support to me. And with also my solicitors as well, who are also an absolutely vital part of the, um, of the, of the, the process of bringing a case in, into, the, into the courtroom arena. So that's a, 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 a relatively short, although probably relatively long as well, um, account of what it means to be a, 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 a KC. Um, and it, it, I mean, the other thing I should say, it does, it does allow you to charge more money because you are seen as a, you know, somebody who's got some particular skills which are marketable and have a value attached to them. And as a result, typically you will, you will earn uh, typically more money than you would as a, as a junior. And I think that's worth, you know, pointing out, you know, it's, it's important in for profit, you know, careers and businesses, you know, if you worked hard to get these these titles and, and, and KC, you know, absolutely, that should be remunerated um, at, at various different, different levels. Time for a short break from the show. Are you looking for a way to get your firm working more efficiently and profitably while ensuring a better work life balance for your team? Well, if you haven't considered our sponsor, Clio, I'm here to strongly recommend that you do. I absolutely love working with Clio. Not only is it the world's leading legal practice management and legal client relationship management software, it also has a really solid core mission to transform the legal experience for all. Something I personally support. What sets Clio apart for me, it's their dedication to customer success and support. There are lots of legal softwares out there, but I know from talking to Clio users that their support offering is miles ahead of the rest with their 24-5 availability via email, in-app chat, and over the phone. Yes, you can actually call in and speak to someone. Clio is also the G2 crowd leader in legal practice management in comparison to 130 legal practice management softwares and has been for the last 14 consecutive Quarters. G2 Crowd is the world's leading business solutions review website. You can check Clio's full list of features and pricing at www.clio.com forward slash legally dash speaking. That's www.clio.com forward slash legally dash speaking. Now back to the show. I want to talk. So let's dive a bit at some of your interesting work in cases and more of your, your 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 recent work in media and entertainment law. If we can switch a little bit, because you um that's included, I believe, in appearing on behalf of David and Victoria Beckham. So can you tell us a little bit, as much as you can, about that case? Yeah, the the, I mean, it's fair to say, Rob, at the risk of disappointing your your listeners. I did. There was a time in my life when I was doing quite a lot of cases in the music sphere. I did a case for. S Club Seven, no less. I did a I did a case for a band which you may have heard of. Some of your listeners might not remember, might not totally remember a band called Dollar. I don't know if you remember, if you remember Dollar. Perhaps perhaps that's they've passed you by. Great great band from the um from the from the um. In fact, and I, but I did a case for I did a case for a band called Bucks Fizz, which may yes may may be more more memorable to you. Um, I did a lot of cases in, in that in in that area. Um, I. I did a case, as you say, for, for 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 David Beckham. I mean, it's fair to say that that um, it was it was some time ago. I don't want to start trumpeting myself as as a leading a leading barrister in the in the um uh in the entertain in the entertainment field. Um, the case for David Beckham, um, it's fair to say, David Beckham. If you were to ask him, would not know who the hell I was. <laughs> I, I, I usually say, you know, they, they, Dave has got a lot of a lot of lawyers around him, and whenever he has to go to court, it was it was a case involving. His nanny, who who had decided to then, I, as I recall it, um, go to the press and, and start telling telling the press all sorts of things about David Beckham, uh, which he rightly wished to um, took the view that this was a a breach of his of his privacy and confidentiality. So it involved certain get, getting injunctions uh, against uh, the nanny, uh, so as to preserve and protect and rightly protect his his um 
his 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 privacy. I mean, it's fair to say that that um, you know careers sort of go in different directions over over time, and my career has perhaps sadly uh, moved more into the into the realm of of heavy business litigation rather than more uh, rather more. Um, uh, media and entertainment cases, which of course means that my dinner party conversation is not quite as interesting as it would <laughs> otherwise be. And it's fair to say that my children often say, well, come on, tell me some famous people you've done cases for recently. And I'd say, well, I did a case for X. And they say, I've never heard of that person. Tell me somebody who's done a really famous person. I said, I'm afraid not all lawyers do cases for very, very famous people. And I've done a few cases for famous people over over the over the years, but sadly, from the point of view of you being able to boast about your father in the playground or in the in the, in the junior common room or wherever you might be, uh, uh, I'm doing cases of a heavy nature, very important cases, I should tell you, but not necessarily the cases that are going to win you win you any kudos in your classroom or in your boarding house. So so I re- I'm very very sorry to have to break it to the to the listeners that I I. I do I do some very interesting cases and and they are not all sadly in the David Beckham in the David Beckham sphere sphere of things. I mean, I will I will say that the most enjoyable and interesting case I ever did, which sadly I don't think I'll ever have a case quite as enjoyable and interesting, was a case a few years ago, which is I suppose broadly speaking in the media and entertainment field, and which dominated my life for many many months, was a case where the painter Francis Bacon, who was a you know. England's greatest painter of the 20th century, he, after he died, his estate, by the people who had an interest in his will, so to speak, um, brought a very large case against Francis Bacon's um, gallery, who, who, which was a gallery which had, had uh, uh, been his sort of business manager, so to speak, for decades uh, uh, in, in the last 30 or 40 years of Francis Bacon's life, and was said to have essentially taken advantage of Francis Bacon to make a very large sum of money out of his paintings and had not given him a fair deal when it came to his paintings, which of course now sell for tens, if not hundreds of millions of pounds. And that was a fascinating case because it involved really being paid to learn about the artistic life and the bohemian life of Soho, which is where Francis Bacon hung out, um, of the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, which had, there was an awful lot of books written about the period and about Francis Bacon's character and personality and life. And given that the case was also all about whether Francis Bacon had been taken advantage of by his his uh, 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 his gallery, it really involved the case really involved a kind of psychoanalysis in the very non technical sense of Bacon as a human being. Was he a man who was absolutely in control of his life? Did he know precisely what was going on or not? Now that's a a rarity to be paid to read, to be paid as a lawyer to read biographies of Francis Bacon and to read books about the bohemian life of, of, of artists and poets in Soho in the 50s, 60s and 70s. That was the pinnacle. That was the absolute pinnacle. And the thought of listening to listening to Lucian Freud and other painters giving evidence in the high court about that case was something that I was absolutely delighted to look for and looking forward to. Sadly, it settled the case um, on the on the doorstep of the court. And settlement, I should say to your listeners, which is a very important aspect of law, is that most cases do not go to court. They you you you, you issue the proceedings, you front them up, you issue do all sorts of legal steps, you generate an awful lot of legal paperwork. And that's towards a settlement where the parties get together and they have a discussion without prejudice or they have a mediation and they work out a, a settlement where they say, well, let's settle our differences on these terms. Uh, and most cases in the civil sphere end up with settlements, which is a, sad in one sense. For you know, It's great to have trials and to get a court, but very good for litigants, because at the end of the day, having a trial is a deeply dispiriting and unnerving and miserable experience for the litigants themselves. Not necessarily for the lawyers, but for the litigants. And of course, at the end of the day, you are a service provider to litigants rather than there to have fun fun in court. Yeah, and I think that's a very important point that, that you raise there when it does come to uh, to settlements. And, and and thank you again for sharing that that fabulous experience of, of, of that case. That would have been fascinating, I'm sure. Oh, it was such a shame it didn't get a court. From one point of view. 
we must continue because there's many more things we need to to, to touch on before um, we, we wrap up, Tom. One of the things I want to talk about is your, your giving back because you also are were a visiting professor of politics and law at Gresham College. You're most recently, I believe, a visiting professor of law at the London School of Economics as well. So how has your teaching contributed to your professional growth and advancement of your, your legal career? And, and do, you, do you see any th- value in terms of reverse mentoring? So the Gresham College, which is a, um, a college, in a, a, it was founded in the Elizabethan period, as in 400 plus years ago, rather than the most recent Elizabethan period. Uh, it's, an, it's an ancient institution, institution and a marvellous institution in the centre of London, which offers out sort of so-called professorships. I was a visiting professor rather than a full professor in all sorts of areas, history, literature, uh, uh, communications and, uh, and astronomy and all sorts of fabulous a- areas, giving free lectures um, to anyone who wants to come and listen to them and, and online as well. And it's a really... A, a really marvelous institution and and i they, they were advertising for visiting professors and full professors and i applied and i was very very honored to have been given a visiting professorship which essentially meant giving a series of lectures uh, over a period of time and i did it for two years and, and i and i gave i think in in total about eight eight lectures um in two separate areas um at, at, so two separate sets of lectures um and um you know, I was very pleased to. I was very pleased to do it because you know there comes a time then when you've been doing law for an awful long time, or one has been doing law for an awful long time, and you want to branch out a bit. And and you know, the idea of just simply spending your entire professional life doing cases can become quite narrow. And one wants to, as I say, branch out. And and I have brought with while I've, I should say immediately while maintaining an absolute 100% practice at the bar, I've not stepped back in any shape or form from being a, a, a barrister. In fact, I appear in very, very large numbers of cases. And, and, but, but as a sort of add-on, I have, have done a lot of lecturing and, and also a lot of public speaking uh, as well. And you know, I, I enjoy it enormously because it is a, you know, a way of um, using one's analy- analytical abilities as a lawyer to explain the ideas of law and the way that law can influence society and the way that law works in all sorts of in all sorts of fields and and so i've i've been delighted to do that and i've very recently appointed um uh, to the to the london school of economics and there i'm doing again it's not it, there's not it's not like a full blown teaching in any way it's very much a, it's very much a uh, dipping in and out giving lectures about about areas not not areas that i practice in on a day-to-day basis, I'm not. I'm not so interested in giving lectures to undergraduates or postgraduates on black-letter law, as we call it, but giving lectures about about the wider practice of law and how, as I say, law can interact with society and and and, and politics. And that's an area I'm I'm very interested in, and I've written quite a lot about as well in sort of non-textbook in in a non-textbook uh, form. And we're going to talk about your writing. That leads us on very nicely, actually, because your book, uh, The Mandela Brief, was published in the summer of 2022. What inspired you to write the book, delving into the life and achievements of Sir Sidney Kedridge Casey? So The Mandela Brief is is very much not a textbook. It is very far removed from my life um, in the the courtroom. But I'm, you know, I see myself very much as an advocate, somebody I, I enjoy advocacy, and I'm I'm very interested in the process of advocacy and and advocacy is transportable in the sense of a great criminal advocate. You can learn a lot from a great criminal advocate. You can learn a lot from a great advocate uh, who 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 practiced in in America or in any other in any other country. And uh, I've written, as I said, I've written a number of books for the general reader. And the Mandela Brief is the most recent, and that, as you say, came out last year. And that was a book about. Uh, a very very great man called Sidney Kentridge, who celebrated his hundredth birthday last year in November, uh, and is still alive and well um, today in July 2023. And Sidney was a uh, is a a man who was born in South Africa in Johannesburg, and for the first really 30 years of his career, practiced in the courts of South Africa, and that was 
at a time when the apartheid regime was uh, being formed and then being uh, practiced in, in a pretty harsh way, uh, and well, a, not a pretty harsh way, a very harsh way. And Sidney found himself as a barrister in South Africa doing an awful lot of cases uh, which were challenging apartheid and the horrors and, 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 and iniquities of apartheid in the criminal courts and also in other courts as well. And he ended up doing cases for a lot of, of the most famous and, and um, bravest of the anti-apartheid activists and politicians, the most famous of which lends its name to the book, The Mandela Brief, Nelson Mandela. And Nelson Mandela in the late 50s was prosecuted alongside many other uh, members of the ANC for treason and the potential penalty for treason at the time was death and for three years it's quite astonishing to think about it for three years Mandela alongside a lot of other great figures of the anti-apartheid movement was on was on trial and Sydney was one of the uh, one of the core advocates who acted for Mandela and, and the, his other co-defendants and um, this was in front of not a jury but three judges all appointed by the state all white obviously white middle-aged men who were highly disposed towards the political dispensation as it then applied i.e., they had no love at all for black anti-apartheid politicians and activists and after three years of very strenuous work mandela was acquitted alongside every single other member of the uh, every single other co-accused and it was one of Sydney's great legal triumphs, and he did a lot of other cases uh, during that period. He acted in the what is known as the Biko inquest for a, another great uh, black South African called Steve Biko, who was beaten to death in a in a prison cell in the late 1970s. And Sydney appeared at the inquest, which was a globally important event uh, covered by all the newspapers around the world, where he exposed the brutality of the South African uh, prison regime and police regime. Um, and he then came to England and practiced in England, Sydney, for a long time and eventually retired at the age of 90, astonishingly, and became really the greatest advocate in England as well. Um, so a truly great figure. And uh, uh, I'd written a book about another very great advocate and a, and a friend of mine who was a friend of Sydney's came up to me about four years ago and said, you really must write about Sydney's life because it's so important because it is so inspiring and I and I delved into it and I agreed and and we had to and I obviously had to approach Sydney and Sydney after a while agreed and that and it became a project and I spent a lot of time with Sydney interviewing him and talking about his life and about his career and at the, the the result of that was a book about Sydney's work in South Africa uh, which as as you say Rob was published uh, a year ago and published in paperback uh, a few months ago this year and um you know, I think it's you know it's something I really enjoyed doing and was very very proud to do and and, and humbled to do, uh, and it was you know an astonishing thing to to get to know a figure like Kentridge who who done who you know his first case was in 1949 and you know was doing a lot of cases in the 50s for people on capital offences and and you know he he witnessed his clients being sentenced to death in the 50s so he was doing very high stakes work um, and it, and it's a book which you know it sold pretty well. And it, it's in really one of its purposes is to inspire people about how the law and the practice of the law can make a huge difference to people's lives. And in Sydney's case, an enormous, you know, he saved people from the gallows, literally saved people from the gallows. And it puts into perspective one's own career uh, when one's typically just saving people from financial liabilities. Um, so that was that was a something I was really very, very pleased uh, and honoured to have to have done. And, and, and a few years earlier, I did a, a book about another very great English advocate called uh, Jeremy Hutchinson, who also reached the age of 100. I'm very keen on centenarian barristers. Um, and and that was and I've done you know other books very much about the celebration of advocacy as something that can really change the world and change lives. Uh, and about and about you know the importance of of law, not just to individual litigants, but to how society moves forward and and how law can shape society and move it on actually in, in, in many ways. And that's an area I'm you know alongside my work doing you know quite narrow cases in the 
financial sphere, uh, something I'm, I'm, I'm very, very interested in and, and I'm pursuing. Absolutely. And as I say, you, you, these are bestsellers as well, um, folks listening in. You, you referenced there that, you know, not only the books, um, but there's more, you know, court number one, the old Bailey trials that define modern Britain in, in 2019. You know, I believe you're currently writing, you know, maybe tell us a little bit about that, the sort of history of England in 25 trials for, for John Murray. Tell us a little bit about that. One. Well, I, I'm, I'm, it's going to be a lot of work, I have to say. I'm, I'm currently working on a book about a sort of history of England, but told through its through some of the great trials that have occurred over the last, you know, over many hundreds of years. And I mean, one of the great things about England, and it's also a melancholy thing, is that it does do trials very well. I'm not sure, I'm not saying they, they, the trials are always absolutely fair, um, and some of them are gross, grotesquely unfair, and some of, you know, some of the trials I'm, I'm looking at uh, end in, in absolutely horrific outcomes. And I, I mean, to take an example, I'm working on a chapter at the moment about the man who prosecuted Charles I uh, in 1649. He then, after the Charles I had been executed, he then lived, lived, led, led a life in interregnum England. He became a judge. Uh, he was a very you know, important person distributed, dispensing you know, very, very enlightened justice for that time. But when Charles II came back into, uh, into power in 1660, then he started thinking about the people who had, as he saw it, killed his father. And the man who led the prosecution was very much in his sights. And, and poor John Cook, a, a very great figure in my view, uh, found, his, found himself himself being prosecuted at the Old Bailey for treason, for having been the prosecutor. Uh, and he, the trial that took place of John Cook in 1660 was a travesty of justice. Uh, and it ended up with John Cook having been the Lord Chief Justice of Ireland, so having been quite a significant figure during the interregnum, being hang, hung, drawn and quartered uh, in Charing Cross. In fact, you can see precisely where he was, he was executed and his execution was you know, a truly appalling um, end to his life. So, I mean, that, that is a, a fascinating and horrifying trial. It certainly uh, doesn't, do, doesn't, doesn't make one feel particularly proud of certain aspects of the English legal tradition. But my word, it casts an enormous uh, light upon the values of that period and the, 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 the willingness of judges and, and society to participate in really grotesque acts of vengeance and blood vengeance on those people who are perceived to have, um, uh, have bucked the system. So I mean, that's just one example of a, of a a case which seems to me to really shed an interesting light on our history. So, I mean, I say England's got a marvellous legal tradition. It's not, I mean, a lot of it does not involve uh, uh, great justice being done. A lot of it involves great injustice being done. But nonetheless, from a historical point of view, very good material. Absolutely. And no doubt will be another fascinating read. And, you know, yeah. So. Before we, we wrap up, Tom, and this will be quite hard for you to sort of probably give that one thing, but what would be your one piece of advice for um, maybe aspiring barristers who are struggling to secure pupillage right now, or maybe current practicing barristers who, who, who maybe have been knocked back from getting KC, not quite made it? Is, is there one sort of piece of advice you would say to being successful um, and basically trying to be you know, the best that they can be in terms of a barrister? The, I'm so far removed from the pupillage process because I, it's so, I'm so sort of, you know, I'm, I'm 25 years plus on, on, on from that, although, of course, I vividly remember my own travails in trying to find a pupillage and the, and the difficulty. And I believe it's much more difficult now because there are so many more uh, law students being, being um, educated now so that the, there are many more people chasing fewer spots or positions than there were in in my day and the and the, the 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 qualifications people have now are truly astounding to 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 when i was starting out when frankly it wasn't quite so important to have endless qualifications so i i feel very much not in a position to give proper and, and helpful advice to to pupils but i mean in terms of advice to barristers a, a little younger than myself perhaps and what the what is the key? What is the key to success? I mean, I, I, God knows whether I'm successful or not. Um, and I don't, sometimes don't think I am. You know, just the, you know, it never gets any easier in, in one in one sense. And one's always there's you know, life is always you know the 
practice of law is always a, a, a struggle and you always, you know, hard work never, never stops, sadly. But I mean, what's the, to, to me, I mean, it's very banal. It's a very banal point, but it's, it's nonetheless a, 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 a true point. There is simply no, um, there's, there's no escape, in my view, from preparation. The way you win cases at the end of the day is through being better prepared. Um, of course, your case can be so bad that whatever, how much, however, however much preparation you do, you can't influence it. And by and large, cases will be lost and, 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 and or, or not lost just on the facts themselves. And there's very little you can do about the, the judge's um, uh, assessment of the facts at the end of the day. But obviously, whenever you do a case, you want to do it as well as possible. And at the end of the day, you've got a duty to your client to just do it as well as possible. They are, after all, paying you. Um, and to my mind, and it's a banal thing to say, but it's true, uh, uh, is preparation, preparation, preparation. There is no shortcut to that, to that. You need to know the papers in your case better than anyone in court. You need to know every fact in the case better than anyone in court. And most importantly, you need to know where that fact is in, the, in, in, your, in your bundle. You need to know precisely where the, the piece of paper that establishes fact X or facts y, fact Y. No good saying to the judge, but no, 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 but this is, this is what happened. To which the answer is, well, where can I find that, Mr. Grant? Where can I, where can I find that? Where, what's, the, what's the document that establishes that? And if, you, if your answer is, it's somewhere in the papers, I don't quite know where it is, then you, you're lost. You've got to be able to say, that, that, this fact is vital and this document establishes that fact. It is, um, I mean, it's crushingly banal in one sense, but at the end of the day, having done hundreds of cases and having spent an awful lot of time in court, that to me is the, the one, or, or the one immediate learning that I would, um, that I would come up with. I would, I would 100% support that and agree with you. And even what mentors have said to me and, you know, mental, you know, specific is terrific. You know, the more specific you can be, um, you know, far easier to, to convince people or get your message across. And you've given some great examples throughout this podcast and discussions actually about the real need to be really kind of focused, do your research to present the absolute best case, best service for your, for your client. It's been fascinating reading. And, and even Tom, you know, he practiced what he preaches, even ahead of the discussion today, he wanted to be as prepared as, 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 as possible. So it's been an absolute pleasure. No, you're brief. That's the critical thing. No, no, and it, and it doesn't get any heart easier. No, I mean when you're you can't subcontract it to your juniors or your solicitors. You yourself, you're standing up, and there's nothing more dispiriting than a question being asked and actually not having the answer. Re Fortunately, that's a very rare occurrence in my in my experience. I mean, whether it's a good answer or not, it's a different matter. But you do need to have the answer. Yep, because or an answer. Accountability there. If it's meant to be, it's up to me, and you take accountability for everything you do. And I, I love that, Tom. So it's been an absolute pleasure, as I say, having you on the show, learning about your background, your journey, your wider pursuits, interests, and I'm sure our listeners will. If they want to know more about you or your books, where's the best way they can find out more, or any website links or social media handles? We'll also share them with this episode for you too. Rob, I am, as so many barristers of my age, I'm not necessarily at the forefront of social media. <laughs> um, I have a, I, I should really have a, my own website, I suppose, but I, I, I think that's generally perceived as slightly vulgar for, for practicing barristers too. Um, I have my Chambers website has a lot of information, or my web page, I should say, has an awful lot of information about me. And I, I, my, my one foray or current foray into social media is is uh, dread to say it, LinkedIn. <laughs> so I do post now and again on on that um the on LinkedIn and um yeah perhaps I'll post this. You most definitely will. And LinkedIn is my if, I, if I'm allowed to, Rob. I don't know if that's if that you... would be a bad form. No, this is actively encouraged. And LinkedIn is my favourite platform. I'm actually an advisor to LinkedIn and their product rollouts and do a lot of work with LinkedIn. So I think you've chose absolutely the best professional networking platform in the world there to to be a part of. And we're we're lucky to have you there. Um, and so from all of us, Tom. It's been an absolute pleasure once again uh, learning so much. I'm, I'm really inspired from what you've discussed today. We'd like to wish you lots of continued success with your future pursuits, your cases and career. But from all of us now on the Legally Speaking Podcast, over and out.
Thank you for listening to this week's episode. If you like the content here, why not check out our world leading content and collaboration hub, the Legally Speaking Club over on Discord. Go to our website, www.legallyspeakingpodcast.com for the link to join our community there. Over and out.